Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Robin Craig Live. I'm Robin Craig, your hostess for the next 60 minutes, and this is a show you don't want to miss because my special guest is Dr. Kathleen Real, and she is a certified financial planner, a widow of six years, and she has her doctorate degree in education, so she's very intelligent, and she knows about money. So tonight we're talking about finances. What do you do when you're widow? What's up with all this, these money issues that we have, and what can we do to protect ourselves? So we're going to be talking to Kathleen in just a moment, but first, it's time for the Critter Update. Now, you all know that spring is here, and I'm telling you, all the wildlife, I mean, everything's out. I've had so many lizards. I was excited last week that Julia shared with me when I was talking about this really bright lime green lizard and how he had this thing that kept coming out. She shared with me that that is supposed to make the boy lizards attractive to the girl lizards, and that's why they do that. Well, today I came face to face with one of them, but it didn't bother me a bit. I thought, well, he's just flirting, you know? It's like it was okay. Um, this last weekend, I was up at Lake Livingston. I spent the weekend with my husband's family. We had a great, great time, and we went from Lake Livingston, which is about an hour and a half northeast of Houston, up to College Station to A&M because my niece, Kate got her class ring. She graduates in August at the ripe old age of 21. Isn't that just like so amazing? And getting your ring at A&M is a big deal. I mean, it was just like a big, massive chunk of gold. She said it's a 15 karat gold ring. And there were just Aggies all over the place. So we had a really great time. And it was fun driving up there because my sister-in-law has two dogs and two cats and they always go to the lake. Obviously you don't want them to stay home and shred your house. So we're driving with cats and dogs and one cat named Spike, he's the cutest little thing, he was sitting on my sister-in-law who was driving on the back of her neck with his feet hanging over the headrest and it was making her head go lower and lower and lower and she kept saying, uh-uh Spike, uh-uh, you're not going to win, and her head kept getting lower and lower, and of course she drove that way the entire trip, and it was so cute. Of course I have pictures. I will be posting those on Facebook very, very soon. But while we were at the lake, the kids wanted to get in the water. It was a little bit cold, so they had floats, and as I'm standing there watching, my niece said, oh, look, and she claims, and I believe her, even though it was April Fool's, I do believe her because she never confessed, that a snake went right behind me and went straight into the water. So quite clearly, I decided I'm not getting in the water, but we made it fine. It was a glorious weekend, really, really, really fun. So tonight, I'm excited because we're going to give away not one, but two books. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Kathleen's book. And also, I want to remind you to be sure and watch next week. And be sure and tell your friends because my guests are Dr. Diana Milowitz and Amy Yazbek, who is the widder, widow of John Ritter. And we all know him. He's had so many fabulous acting roles, but I think most of us still find that our favorite was Three's Company. So Amy is going to talk about the Ritter Foundation, and I'm going to talk to the doctor that's been involved in the disease that killed uh, John. And it wasn't really a disease, but it's thoracic aortic dissection. You never want to try to say that too quickly, so be sure and watch next week. Now, without further ado, let's get Kathleen on the phone. Hello, Dr. Kathleen. You're on Robin Craig Live. Good evening. I'm delighted to be here. How are you? I am um, in rainbow territory, I guess you'd say. <laughs> Things are really good. Well, I'm so happy that you're here because your book, I really enjoyed your book. This is it. It's called Moving Forward on Your Own a financial guidebook for widows, and it's only 80 pages, and that's what makes it so great. It's very straightforward, it's easy to read, so if you're newer at being widowed, and you read the book, and you think, oh, my head's all crazy, I can't focus, you will be able to focus on this book, because it's easy to read, it's got wonderful artwork, and wonderful pictures, and we're giving away two copies tonight. So, Kathleen, congratulations 
on completing your book and writing something that's so helpful to all of us. Thank you, and it's, it's very gratifying the response that um, we've gotten to that to the book. We're actually we just got the third printing of the book done, and as you and I had said earlier, it has won seven national book awards, and we're up for one more, an international award, but we won't find out about that until this summer. And it's been featured in about three dozen popular magazine publications like the Wall Street Journal, uh, New York Times, Kiplinger wrote the book up, Bottom Line Personal, and many others. That is just really super. Congratulations to you. I know you're doing a lot of speaking engagements, and it's important because, you know, for whatever reason, finances freak us out when we are first widowed. Why do you think that is, Kathleen? I think a big part of that is because, as you and I have both experienced ourselves, there's that early phases of grief that impact us, and that has a, an effect on our, our cognitive ability to think. And even I've worked with very smart PhD-type women who have come to my office, and I can remember one gal, Ellen, came in and she said, Kathleen, would you help me to read this financial statement because I am just not able to make sense of it anymore. Whereas she had done that. Well, she's in the early phases of grief, and there's this cognitive disconnect, this research which is actually validated that parts of the brain shut down. Okay, well that's good to know because I have talked to so many people and money matters just seem to be virtually impossible. As a matter of fact, I've talked to a number of widows who shared with me that their husbands took care of paying all the bills and all the paperwork in their household. And once the husband died, the widow was so freaked out that she couldn't even open the bills. It was as if it were a reminder of him being gone. So they just went like this, put them all together, and just threw them in a box and forgot about them. What do you say to women who are doing that? Uh, and that, your, your comment earlier about how the husband had taken care of certain things and and the wife may not have been involved. That's not uncommon at all. And in fact, I was at a, um, a luncheon with a couple of uh, a months ago, and we were sitting around a, um, a table. This was a community luncheon, and we had introduced ourselves. And one of the ladies was looking at me. She was looking at me, and she said, Oh, I know you. I know you. I recognize you. You were in the St. Petersburg Times. You wrote that book about widows. I said, well, yes, yes, that was me. And she said, but I'm never going to need to buy your book because George, and she acknowledged George right better, he takes care of everything in our household. He does all the money things, and yes. he's so good at it, and I'm just bored with yes. that. So, but I looked at George, and he looked like he was quite a bit older than she was, and probably um, George is going to be the one to pass first, and she will be in double jeopardy because she'll be in la-la land. She won't know anything about the finances because she didn't want to learn about them. And then she'll be in grief. Well, and, and really, for anybody who's watching this show who is not widowed but married, learn what your spouse does. I just can't stress that enough. And it's hard to think like that because that's one of the beautiful things about being married is that you can share duties and you do what you're best at and your spouse does what he or she is best at and then you have more time to spend together. But as we keep seeing time and time and time again that when your spouse dies, then you're just completely lost in those those categories and money seems to be a big one for a lot of women and um, I can only imagine how it must feel because that was not my situation but I can only imagine how it feels to just see all the bills we all hate looking at them but to just sweep them up and throw them in a box I mean that obviously doesn't get you too far when US News and World Report did a, they did a beautiful piece on this book but the reporter said one of the best gifts you can give your spouse, if you're, I mean, if you're still, both of you here on this earth, is to talk about the pins and the passwords. What's in the safe deposit box? 
Are the beneficiaries up to date on the will? What is the, um, like, if, if spouses are working, what is the um, plan, like the 401k plan? What does that look like so that you have these conversations? And granted, you don't have to do it all in one evening, but um, bit by bit, you can talk about it over, over time so that those things are known before the time comes for the death. Yes, yes, I'm with you completely. Do your spouse a favor and say, here's how you do what I do in case the worst happens. But a lot of people obviously are not in that boat. How do you dig yourself out if you are one of those widows who's just gathering everything and throwing them in a box? And I have had those that come to me that way. And so we begin sorting things out and getting things organized. And um, back in in my book, if, if you if you look at um, steps for recent widows, we talk about setting up file folders with different colors. So you've got one for the bills that are coming in. Maybe you've got another one that has um, information that needs to go to the CPA. It might be related to a tax return that's, that's coming up this time to do. Or as you've got estate settlement things that you want to give the attorney. So begin by, by organizing things. Okay, so color coding, getting file folders in separate colors can help you begin the organization process. And you start to look at what you have, and then you pick certain categories, and then you file them in the colors. And obviously, some of the file folders will need immediate attention. Some of the other file folder content you can wait to deal with. Right. Some of the things like settling the estate, that's going to happen sooner rather than, than later. Okay. Uh, most, most likely. And, and, and collecting benefits, like um, if there's... Um, pension that had been in place already, how the changes are. Social Security, if that was started, there's going to be that. Perhaps um, a woman will be beginning a widow's benefit. There, may, there might be uh, veterans' benefits that they qualify for. Or if, if the husband had a, an IRA or a, uh, a 401k at work, uh, decisions about rolling that over. So, yes, there are other things that, that will need a bit more time. Yeah, because, you know, Kathleen, that's one thing that's so difficult. When you're in such a fog, you don't even know who to even call to try to figure out what kind of benefits you or your kids are entitled to. And it can be very helpful to get together with a, a girlfriend who might be thinking more logically at this point or working with a professional or professional on on sorting out and coming up with a system or using something like what's outlined in the book, but to give some direction so that the widow feels like I'm not totally out on my own on this. There yes, is. and do you recommend that if people can afford to, that it's good to have a CPA, an attorney, and a certified financial planner? Oh, yes. In fact, I've got my own financial planner. Wow. You may think, well, Kathleen, don't you know all that stuff? Well, it's like, think of a doctor. A doctor doesn't do her own surgery. That's true. That's true. Doctor. And especially, so especially if you're in that fog. Doing things with. Now, granted, mm. um, and, and in fact, my financial advisor was very, very helpful for me. I was one of those women who, believe it or not, was in a fog initially. I couldn't remember where I put my car keys. I remember I was filling out a form one day, and I did not know my Social Security number. Now, that's something we all memorized since we were a kid. And I thought I was really going crazy. And then I thought about my financial issues. And just for a short period of time, I was really, really concerned because I'm wondering, am I going to be able to make it? My husband's Social Security check, that would stop. He was a pastor, so he, he didn't have a huge pension, but that pension was going to get smaller now that I was a widow. And he was a vital part of my business, and now he was gone, so I didn't know if I would be able to continue with the business. Well, it wasn't very long before I put my financial planner hat back on, and I realized when I ran my numbers, I was going to be okay. And I met with my financial planner, and she confirmed that, indeed, this was 
this was the case. But um, and, and I'm meeting. Uh, this is a good one. This is I'm in my sixth year now. I did some initial estate planning after Tom's death, but next month I've got an appointment with a um, an attorney that I've um, I've known for quite a while, and I've said, you know, I want you to take me through everything all over again, just to update things. And I work with a um, CPA also, so you're right. So I think Thank that's you. I, I think. You. I think that's fabulous that a financial planner got a financial planner. But it's a classic case of sometimes you just can't see the forest for the trees because you've got so much on your mind and you just can't think clearly. So in order to protect yourself and ensure that you're not making mistakes, just get some good hired help if you can. How should people go about hiring people like financial planners, attorneys, and CPAs when they lose their spouse? How do you know if you've got a good one or not? All right, there are many types of financial professionals out there. Okay. And in, in the book, I'm recommending that people consider working with what's known as a fee-only financial planner. Okay. They're individuals that don't sell products. They and provide advice. And there's a, a website that I've listed in the book, but... There's a national organization, it's called the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors. There's also a group called Cambridge Advisors, and these individuals work nationwide across the country, and there, there are websites that you can go and find planners in your area. Um, perhaps uh, an individual has a recommendation, like, oh, my, my friend Joe is a great financial planner, you, you should talk with him. But... So want to get like two or three possibilities and call those planners and just talk about what it is that her situation is, what she, what she believes that she's looking for. Mm -hmm. And many times um, an advisor will have um, an initial consultation at no charge where there will either be a phone meeting mm -hmm. or an in-person meeting um, to assess the situation and then talk about what might be done okay. in the arrangement. Okay, so it's really good, even though I know it's tiring when you're grieving, but it's still recommended to pick three people with the same job, meet with them, explain your situation, and then see if you get a vibe or a feeling or you like one better than another for any reason. Yes, and with brand new widows, I, I often encourage them, like if they have a family member that they want to have come along. And oftentimes I've had like an adult son who's come to the meeting or a sister or a friend because that gives her two sets of ears to hear what's going on because she, um, it, it just may be helpful to have that moral support of someone coming along for that meeting and also to assess with her. Okay. Find out Okay, very good. And if you can speak up just a little bit for me, Kathleen, it would be very helpful. Now, what is it, we all blunder our way through widowhood, but what have you found to be maybe the top mistake that widows make financially? All right. One of the first ones is they may want to move too quickly on things. And I suggest that for the first year that they postpone some major decisions when possible. But granted, you're going to have to um, have the funeral. You're going to want to file to collect benefits. But there are other things that maybe don't have to happen right away. For example, um, let me tell you about Mary. She attended one of my women's seminars, women and money seminars. And afterwards, she came up to me and she said, I was just too embarrassed during the, 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 the workshop to tell you the mistake that I made, but here's what happened. She had, um, after her husband died, the insurance agent asked to come out and deliver a $50,000 life insurance check to her and express condolences. And she said, that would be fine. So he came out to her with the check, and he said, now, when um, George was alive, he had this policy, and he was really smart, but you don't have any life insurance on you. And George really probably would have wanted you to have life insurance. And I've got this super-duper product that I can give you um, for, for this week only, 
There is an extra 5% kicker. If you sign on right now, it's going to save you taxes. Um, it will be a really good investment vehicle for your kids someday. And before he left, he had sold her. She had written that, that $50,000. She basically had endorsed that back to the company, to this agent, because she thought, well, I better invest it right away. Um, I'm, I'm going to lose out on this 5%. She didn't even know what she was investing in. And it was a couple of months later that she called the company and said that she wanted out of it because, indeed, she was thinking about moving into a, a retirement facility and needed an, an upfront payment for that. And here her money was locked up. Well, the insurance company said they could send it back to her, but there was going to be um, what's called a surrender charge that was levied against that, so she wouldn't get the full 50000 back. So she asked, what could we do about it? And I said, well, I'm not sure, but we'll, we'll try I called the um, insurance company and I said, well, we wouldn't want to have to go to the state insurance regulators for this as an inappropriate sale to um, a widowed woman in her 70s who really didn't understand what she was buying. And it was very short order that she got her check for $50,000 back without having that surrender charge deducted from it. Now, so that was a case of she was rushing. She could have just left that money in a money market account at the insurance company, and most insurance companies with death benefits will put this into, it's like a, even a, a, a check-writing account. And currently, many of these right now are paying 3%. And actually, 3% is pretty darn good because it's very hard to find a money market out there that's paying 3%. So, so one of the biggest mistakes that people make is just maneuvering too quickly before the fog lifts or the dust settles, as the case may be. And then after the fact, they look back and think, had I been in my right mind, I wouldn't have made the decisions I made. Yes. So a widow can give herself permission to be in what some people call this a, a no decision zone about something for a period of time, which might be six months. It might be up to a year. Yes. Um, another financial, big financial mistake, which kind of ties into the first one I was talking about, is to beware of financial wolves, because widows are very, very vulnerable. Yes. Um, yes. My, my Aunt Eileen yes. was in a situation where she was sold an investment by the nephew of a friend of hers in church, and it was uh, buying Iraqi dinars. This happened last fall. And... She was told that, um, actually, she told me about it last fall. She had bought it um, about a year ago and was told that since the war in Iraq was winding down, if she bought these Iraqi dinars, when the war was over, they were going to be worth twice the value. So she bought these things. Well, she was supposed to start receiving money back in June. Nothing came. July, nothing came. In fact, it was after um, Camp Widow, where I was spoke last year. My aunt lived near there. I went to visit her, and she said, would I, would I look at these investments? And I said, you know, Aunt, Aunt, Aunt Eileen, when, we, when there's something that doesn't kind of look right, we can just go into the computer and type in um, some keywords. So I typed in Iraqi dinar scam, and it just, it was just, there were many, many hits. And evidently, this was something that really was popular a couple years ago. It died down, and it was back again. And so, all these, these beautiful dinars, which they sent her by mail, they had sent her an account, um, supposedly at a bank. It was all bogus. It was all fake. But he trusted. He wanted this to be um, a good investment. And so, but she was so, so how wonderful. did, so, Kathleen, how did they know it was fake, though? How did she know it was fake? Yes. Or, all right. When... We went in and we checked out this scam online. I mean, it, it's all bogus. It's just smoke and mirrors. It doesn't, um, they had printed up these scenarios. They, they were not real. They had set up the program saying that when the war is over, this is going to, this currency is going to double in value, which it's not going to, didn't happen at all. So the whole thing was just a ruse. Goodness gracious. Well, and you know, and we know that we're vulnerable when we become widowed, but it's still really hard to figure out what to do. And if you can't afford professional help, 
do you recommend that you get a trusted friend or family member to just kind of look over your shoulder when it comes to money matters? Yes, yes. And when there is family available to step in, this will be a big help. But I've, I've had some widows, though, who have come, come to me and said, I don't want to be dependent on my son or my daughter. They lead very, very busy lives. And so after the, the initial period where they immediately come in to assist, they want some ongoing help, and mm -hmm. they don't want to be a burden on the, the children. Okay. All right. That's really good information. Now, one part of your book that I found interesting was about just money history. And you have a place where people can fill in their own answers to what's your first memory about money and that sort of thing. Why is it important in dealing with money today to look at your history with money and to go all the way back as far as remembering your very first memory of money? Why is that so important? Some of those early experiences with money will carry through with our behaviors as an adult. And those messages that we learned when we were growing up. Okay. Um, like, for example, um, when I when I I grew up on a farm, and we didn't have very much money, and it was definitely um, a matter of counting our pennies to be sure that uh, Dad could make the farm payment every month, and that we could take care of other responsibilities. So I've seen that carry through me as an adult, and so sometimes I'm maybe even overly cautious about money. There are, I've, I've worked with women who have, have told me that um, growing up, like, money was never discussed in the family. It was like, it was taboo. In fact, I kind of laugh now, like, like money is, is, is one of the last um, taboos. I mean, we, we, we talk about all kinds of things today, but, but you don't really um, go to a cocktail party and, and start chatting with your um, your friends about, well, what is it that you make right now? Really? But anyway, <laughs> this, this lady had um, grew up in a household where they had never discussed money, and it was just um, really a, a foreign entity for her. So that's one of the reasons it was especially hard now as a w new widow to deal with it, because even when she was married, she had pushed that responsibility off and, and did not want to pay much attention to it. So... Um, money can, for some people, what money buys brings a lot of happiness, and that relates back to childhood experiences where maybe when something was celebrated, there was going out to eat or buying a new dress or something where spending money was associated with celebrating that event. So it's, it's kind of fun when you, you look at some of your behaviors and and see where the ramifications are. I mean, that, that really is because you're right. A lot of times people go eat something whenever there's something to celebrate. There are other people who say, well, I don't want to blow my diet, but it's okay for me to go buy a new dress when I'm celebrating something. So that is very interesting to think if we look at how money was introduced to us and our perception of money as we grew up and then, of course, through the marriage, then you can kind of get a better feel for where you are when you're on your own and you can look at things that perhaps need to be changed that's really great yeah, yeah I love that, that, that now same, kind of that, that same flavor is what your money style is or your money personality and that can be real interesting to look at you may have like people who are, are nesters for example and they think that, that money invested in their home brings a lot of happiness and then you've got people that are really spenders, and they, they prioritize, and they get a lot of pleasure yes. enjoying. You've got people who are hoarders. Bag ladies, oh, that's a common one with, with widows. Most, In fact, most widows who come to me have experienced some fear of being a bag lady. Even I've had women who are worth many, I mean, multimillionaires who have, have come into me, and they're afraid that they're not going to have enough versus... Yes. Someone who has um, far less means wondering, am I going to have enough? But there is that, that, little, that little bag lady syndrome that is very, very common with Yes, and 
really, when you're by yourself, you start to look at a lot of things differently and you realize that you have to be able to take care of yourself and how much money you have and what you do with it is really important. And for a lot of people, as you know, you come into your widow or widowerhood with life insurance money and it can feel like a lot of money going into it, but then I talk to people all the time, and I'm sure you do too, Kathleen, that just wound up thinking, I really don't even know where it went. I mean, people start paying off their debt and that kind of thing, and then after a few years, they go, all oh, my money's gone. Or they can be tapped by other family members yes. or friends for that money, Yes, and they may just give it away without thinking in terms of, oh, maybe I need this to be put away for my retirement down the pike. Yes. That it looks like a lot. Or And sometimes this, I refer to it as blood money almost. And a widow will want to get rid of it. It's like they feel guilty that they've got this. Like, oh my gosh, I'm more wealthy now than before Fred died. Yes. Because I've got all this insurance money. Yes. And it's just not right. You know, I can now afford to go to Europe or I can now help my grandkids in college and I couldn't do that before. I just I just don't like it. And they may be not even thinking about this consciously, but because they they don't really um, feel comfortable with this, they may fritter it away, they may give it away, or if it's a widow and she um, enters after a period of time the dating room again. In fact I've we we talk about this in my workshops and it's even in the book. I've said be careful about being a purse for potential suitors, because there are fellows out there who look to widows as an easy touch. Oh, I know. We've all just heard story after story after story about that. And also, just on the social media sites, all of us have had people, um, some of them in America, some of them outside of the country, but they act like, oh, you're so wonderful and you're so beautiful and you're so all of this and I think you're the woman of my dreams. And in reality, they're just trying to see how much money you have and what it would take to get it. Yes, yes. I yeah, have several so women who can tell you several stories along that line. Yes. I know, and that's just the saddest. I've heard of so many scams, and, um, you know, it just seems sad because when you've lost love, the greatest gift is if you can find love again. But the sad part is that sometimes you think you found love and you really didn't. Yeah, that's so hard. Well, now, we know that when your spouse dies, you need to put property and assets in your name. You need to change over the title to property in your name. And also, you need to change the beneficiary so that if something happens to you, when should people take care of those things? That's something that if there, and it also goes um, along with a new will, um, it's amazing the number of people that don't have wills. And when you're a couple, a lot of times most of your assets are in joint names. So at the death of the first spouse, the second spouse inherits that, no problem at all. And when you have a, a 401k account at work, you needed to have a beneficiary on that account. Or if you started an IRA, you needed to have a beneficiary. And so the spouse was typically named there. Yes. So there's um, a, a secondary beneficiary, which may have been in place. And so if the surviving spouse, so the widow is concerned about, oh, I need to, to do this instantly, probably not instantly, but you don't want to wait a real long time for it because there could be something that happens to that surviving spouse and you want to be sure that it goes where you want it to go. Yes, I know. I did a show a while back talking about how anyone who may be predisposed to heart trouble could easily have a heart attack when grieving for their spouse. And what a terrible mess it is for the family if the paperwork is not in order. So, so what I hear you saying is as soon as you feel that you can handle you want, most people have an idea of who their second runner-up would be as a beneficiary once they lose their spouse. But as soon as you can possibly handle that, go ahead and put property in your name and make sure that you have your estate planning documents together. Yes, and that also includes um, power of attorney, advanced medical directives, 
So yes. you would be naming who you want to make decisions about you if you're not able to, because probably you had your husband named for that. And yes. you may have had a backup, but you may not have had a backup either. So you definitely want to get those advanced health care directives updated also. Yes, and you know, it's it's interesting because I'm a paralegal in addition to being a TV producer and everything else I do. And when my husband and I got married in the 80s, I knew that when we had, well, the first thing we did was just go and get our final documents. And I chose three different executors. And as a result, I still haven't had to redo my final paperwork. And of course, attorneys, not knocking attorneys, I have a lot of great friends who are lawyers, but they don't always tell you that because they're cutting themselves out of money that they would get when you would come back in to revise everything. But going into it, if you can put a first, second, and third choice on your paper, work, then you don't have to keep running back in in case something happens to who you've got listed. You don't have to run back in and add somebody else to that. Yes, and oftentimes as a surviving spouse, let's say you have your investments with um, uh, a firm like the Vanguard Group, you can name your account to be titled transferable on death, which is POD, so that at your passing, assets go directly to your kids or whoever benef whichever beneficiary that you want, and that passes outside of the probate process. So that can be um, very easily done. Another yes. asset that if you're looking at the um, like retirement assets, it may be appropriate to roll them over into your own, let's say your, your husband had a, an, an IRA account, roll them into your own. If there was a 401k or 403b plan through work, it may be um, best to roll that into yours, but it might not. If, for example, if if you draw assets out before age 59 and a half from um, a traditional plan, you're going to pay ordinary income tax plus a 10% extra amount because you've done it before 59 and a half. But if you um, set it up correctly, you can take money out before age 59 and a half without that 10% penalty. But that's beyond the scope of what we really want to talk about tonight. But you Well, yes. But, but the bottom line is that everybody needs to have their, their final estate planning documents. And you should consult the professionals when doing this. Because I, just like you just said, I hear people all the time that say, oh, I got penalized for this. Or, oh, I had this amount tacked on. And if I had only known this sooner, I could have made it better. But we don't seem to know what to do if we don't work in those fields. So just getting some really good advice is key. Now, in your book, you talk about decluttering your life. What's that about? Oh, that can be organizing all kinds of things. It can be your house. In addition to just finances in general, I have a, a number of widows that after a period of time, they move into a phase where they're ready to turn our house into my house, and they will make changes in that house okay. that uh, reflect perhaps their personality a little bit more yes. than the couple's personality, yes. and it also feels like a positive step. Yes, moving forward. yes, I Everybody did that. Everybody has got their own timeline, their own journey. Yes. Some widows are more ready to clean out the closet and remove Henry's clothing than others will. Yes. But those can be donated to a, a charity, and you can get a tax deduction for that. Yes. There's, there's decluttering of the house. Then yes. there's decluttering of the investments that can happen. I had one widow who came to me, and um, her husband had been a very brilliant neurosurgeon. And when he died, she knew that he was heavily invested in the stock market. And this was before the the recession before it went down. Okay. Um, so she came to me and she said, I think he's got, he had a lot in stock and, and I don't think that's right for me. Well, we sorted things through and indeed about 95% of their investments, and this is a woman in, in her early 70s, 95% was in stocks, in risky Asian stocks. And so she said, yeah, we need to, I, w I want to be in more safe, secure investments. And for a, a widow, especially a new widow, safety and security are much more important than being in the hot stock that's going to be, um, give her bright
bragging rights? No, she's not concerned about that. She wants to know that she can live in her house, that she can help the grandkids, that she can still travel, that she can give to her charitable organization. But anyway, back to her stocks. So we we created a plan that was going to put her in more safe, secure investments with a little bit of stock for growth. And it came the day for us to flip the switch to sell the stock. And she said, I can't do it, Kathleen. And I said, why not? She said, because he was so smart and he picked all the good things. And I feel like a traitor if I sell this stock. So we had to talk about, you're in a different place right now, and it's time to get rid of these. And there, there were dozens and dozens of these stocks. Gosh. So she said, all right, I understand, wow. and, I, and I do want to be more safe and secure. So it was almost like Bill had his hand coming out of the grave, was controlling from the grave on her um, investments. But she went, went ahead, and we, we sold those. We put her into investments that were more appropriate for her, and that helped also to declutter. And they were spread out. They were in many different financial institutions. She couldn't even keep the paperwork straight. So we brought it all together with, with one financial Well, and you know, you bring up an interesting point. I think a lot of widows feel guilty when they start for lack of a better phrase, wheeling and dealing and selling and buying and moving and renovating and all of those things. I think widows have a lot of guilt in that regard. Like, okay, well, he's gone, so now I'm just having a party. What do you say to people who feel that way? That is, it's all part of the evolving of her moving, of her transitioning, and it's a part of her healing and her growing. Yes. And she is moving into a different phase of her life. She's at a different place. So it's actually a way of demarking that she's making progress. Yes. And it's hard to do, but, you know, we all have to accept when our spouses are gone that they are gone and we can't feel guilty. We have to do what is required to take care of ourselves and to create a new life and to find happiness however we possibly can. So that's good to know. Now, another thing that I thought was cute in your book is how you recommend making a game out of finding inexpensive things that are for entertainment that maybe are free or don't cost very much. I love that. And so I gave suggestions like, here, I'm in the Tampa Bay area in, in Florida. So we have a wonderful array of outdoor concerts that um, pop in the, in, the, in the park is, is what some of them go by. It doesn't cost anything to pack up a little picnic sandwich and take your easy chair and go enjoy yes. that, that, that outdoor environment. And there are art festivals. And it's fun to get together with a girlfriend. And our girlfriends are so important yes. when we're widowed. And, yes. But get together with a girlfriend and go to one of these art festivals. There are um, lectures, um, educational um, opportunities that are inexpensive. And this also saves on the budget. Mm-hmm. Yes, and because a lot of people, when they lose their spouse's income, they just really have no money at all. And then that makes it feel worse that you can't really get out of your house and do much. But as you're saying, there are a lot of things that are free. And if you make a game out of it with your girlfriends to look for these types of things, um, even if it's a, a free poetry reading at the library, all of those things can be really fun and unusual. But you, if you make a game out of it, then you don't really feel pitiful. You're like, okay, I'm on a mission. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to get out of the house. I have a zero budget. I'm going to look and find the concerts, the poetry readings, the festivals, all the things that you can just go and enjoy being around people. I think that's super. And even even like little little things like yeah, going out to eat instead of going out and eating a full meal someplace, you get together and go to the Cheesecake Factory and you have a wonderful dessert and a cup of coffee. Yes. Rather than the whole meal without spending a lot of money. Yes. Okay. Um, now I talked to a widower once and. He had this situation, and I imagine it's happened to other people, and I'd like to hear what you say about it. He said, my investor gave me some bad advice eight months ago. I had $50,000 in an IRA that I rolled over in my name. 
I took $15,000 and paid the penalty at that time, but I just found out that I have to claim that on this year's income tax return. I was not told this before, and now I will be put in a much higher tax bracket. I don't have any idea where I will come up with the money. Will they put liens on my home and business, or is there a way that the IRS will work with me? Okay. Now, I, I don't know all the facts and, and circumstances in that, um, but it, it sounds like the money that he took out of his IRA, um, like there's there's a, a two-month window where you can put it back, and it's just considered whole again. And if he if he took if if, if he has if he still has that money and could still put it back, then he would avoid those those penalties and that extra tax. But he may be in a situation where he took the money out because he needed it for something. Yes, and so, yes, and that's usually the way it is. But sometimes we just don't get full information, and we we wind up suffering for it rather than understanding all the facts up front and making the right choice. Right, and I don't have direct experience with that kind of a situation, but I have heard other advisors speak about where it's been a mistake, not on the individual's part, but by the advice that he received from the financial institution. And so when uh, working with the CPA, the tax preparer, they, um, they ask for some leniency from the IRS on that. But like I said, I don't have direct experience myself. In okay. Well, I, th I think the message here is that you want to be really, really careful when you go into any kind of a transaction, whether it's buying or selling or trading or whatever, and make sure that you've got really great advice so that you ask don't have... Questions. Ask questions. Some yes. widows say, well, it's not really polite to ask. Well, it is. It's your money. I mean, ask questions like, why is that financial recommendation good for me? What are my alternatives? Uh, what are the fees and expenses related to that investment? And also ask, how are you compensated? Because those are all, all things that it's good for you to know. Yes, absolutely. Well, Kathleen, let's take a moment and let's give away two copies of Moving Forward on Your Own, a financial guidebook for widows. It's an easy read. There's a lot of great information. There are areas where you can fill in your own answers and just get a handle on where you are personally with money. Uh, we're going to give away two of those. So I've got my trusty basket here. Let me draw a number. And here it is. Okay, I've got my number. You guys in the chat room, pick a number between 1 and 50. And the two people that are closest to this number are going to win. So everybody pick a number between 1 and 50. And then you guys help me figure out when everybody's put their number in there. Okay, does everybody have a number in there? Okay. All right, has everybody got a number? It looks like everybody does. Okay, the number that I picked is 21. So it looks like Judy, Judy Kahn is number 22. And it looks like Julia is number 18. Okay, so Julia and Judy. Nyla, I'm going to ask you if you would please get their addresses for me. And then Kathleen will mail you a copy of this fabulous book. And also, if you guys want to buy the book, you can find it on Amazon. And uh, also, can you buy it on your website, Kathleen? Yes, and okay. that website is my okay. name, which is Kathleen Real, spelled R. There it is. Okay, I just put it on the screen. Kathleen, K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N. Her last name is pronounced real, but it is spelled R-E-H-L dot com. So I've got her website up on the screen. And you guys can buy the book there. You can buy it on Amazon. There's Indigo Sherry. Hey, girl. 
she likes to stop by and say hi to everybody. Um, so I'm excited about that. Now the other thing that we got to do is give away a case of bean itos. These are these wonderful chips. They are corn free, gluten free, potato free, trans fat free, cholesterol free, and you're going to get a case of them free. Now in order to win these, you got my cat is just too funny. She had to just walk by to the other side. Anyway, go to my website, Robin Craig Direct. Dot com and the tenth email that uses the word Benitos is going to get a case. Now Doug Morris, who is in the chat room, got his Benitos. Doug, I'm waiting for you to post a photograph, whether it's you eating them or otherwise, on my wall. So I'm watching for that. I get a kick out of watching you guys and seeing how you photograph your case of Benitos. So show me some of this creativity that you were talking about a little bit earlier in the show. So I'm excited about that and congratulations to you guys. And also, Kathleen, could you please autograph the two books to the recipients? I certainly will. Okay, excellent. And I will provide you with that information uh, right away. Now, um, one thing that was so cute in your book is the big grin goal. Tell everybody about that. Oh, that's fun. I do that every year with, with all of my, my clients. I do it with myself, too. And I invite them to identify a big grin goal, something that they would like to accomplish in the coming year. And if you think of the word grin, it what puts a smile on your face. So something that is related directly or indirectly to money. Now, for many of the clients that I work with, and the majority of these folks are middle-aged and, and older, but oftentimes travel is one of their big grin goals. It may be something related to a special event with family. That often is factored in. It may be a celebration that's coming up. Now, one of my own big grin goals for this year is going to happen in just a couple of months. It's a family oh. reunion. And we are getting together along the shores of a lake in Wisconsin near where I grew up. This is going to be bringing together family members from California, from Minnesota, from Colorado, from Illinois, and down in Florida, and we've got two cottages, well, actually they're more than cottages, they're big houses along the Lake Rand, and I'm just really thrilled about it. And I'm going to be paying the expenses for people to come in, to fly in for this, and I'm picking up the, the tab on the house because I'm just thrilled that everybody is coming together. It might be a big grin goal, it might be something related to one's professional work, it okay. might be something related to a hobby, it might be... A, um, a spiritual retreat that someone wants to go to. It's whatever has meaning for that individual and will make them happy, put a big smile on their face. And I check up with my clients along the way to see how we do it on the progress. I, I love that. And so, so to be able to plan something that makes you feel happy and it makes you smile and to see how money is part of that, whether it's paying for a vacation, whether it's travel expenses for somebody to come and visit you, whether it's some kind of a goal that you have that involves money somehow, just something that makes you smile. I think that's really great, Kathleen, because we all need something to look forward to. Yes, I agree. <laughs> yes, I think that is just really super great. Um, I love that you know, you do a lot of quotes in your book, and I'm really big on quotes. They Some people just say things just the perfect way. You quoted Anne Frank as saying, we can't control our destiny, but we can control who we become. And I think that is the most important thing about being a widow is that for a little while, we tend to feel like victims, and we don't know what to do. We feel like amputees we feel like half of a person so it takes a lot for us to come into our own and to get our house like we wanted and to start learning how to live as a single person again so to have positive goals to look forward to is really important and to understand that about the only thing that we really can control is who we become and in the end that's really the most important thing of all and moving along as the, in the early stages when a widow is transitioning. And then as I watch the widows that I work with, as they go through their own personal transformation, yes. it's just, um, it's, it's awesome. 
I love that. I feel privileged. I love that. And the fact that you can write down things in your book, I think that's beautiful because that allows you to go back at a later date and you may have written something that's really doesn't apply to you now. So you're able to monitor the changes that you've made. And that's so beautiful. Thank you. And the the book itself is, uh, you mentioned that, I mean, it's beautiful. It's all in color and it's It's original art. It really is, and, and that was the thing that I commented on. It's Not only is it easy to read, but it's got a lot of beautiful artwork in it and um, a lot of nice quotes and places for you to fill in your answers, and it's not too big. You know, as you can see, it, it's rather narrow. It's not too big, um, but it's really a great book, so I hope that a lot of people who didn't win will buy your book, and congratulations to Julia and Judy, who will be looking forward to receiving your book, Kathleen. I want to thank you so much. I've got 150 more questions. I knew that the hour would fly by, but I appreciate the work that you are doing to help the widowed with the finances, and I appreciate you being on Robin Craig Live tonight. And thank you. And I should also note that that the proceeds from the book all goes to a fund that I established, Moving Forward on Your Own, and this is a fund that benefits, helps widows and widows and their children. And we've, we've made the first three grants already out of it, and I'm just, I'm, I'm thrilled that, that um, this is happening with the book also. It's so wonderful, honey. I just think you're the greatest. I'm so glad that I had an opportunity to meet you, and uh, I just wish you the very best, and you'll have to promise to come back. Thank, thank you. All right, girl, have a good evening. Good night. Bye-bye. Wow, what a great informative show. We could have talked forever and ever and ever, but I think that she was able to say enough to where you can understand the benefit of this book. And finances are really critical for all of us. We're by ourselves, and we have to be able to take care of ourselves and to plan well. And there's a lot of stuff that we clearly just don't know about money. And a lot of us look back and think, you know, could I redo it? I would redo it, but we can't redo it. So it's important to try to figure things out up front and not make the mistakes and avoid the pitfalls if at all possible. So gosh, guys, I really appreciate you all being here tonight. Um, It's been a really great evening, and I want to encourage you once again to log in next Tuesday. I'm really excited to have the widow of John Ritter, one of my favorite comedians and actors, and she will be on the show as well as Dr. Diana Milowitz, who is here in Houston at the Medical Center. And it's amazing. He died from thoracic aortic dissection. It appeared to be a heart attack, so he was treated for a heart attack when the treatment for what he had is the opposite. So it's something that we all need to learn about because a lot of people have said, um, I wrote about them when I was writing my blog for the Houston Chronicle, and a lot of people said, you know, I've had a lot of heart attacks in my family, and it makes you question, were they really heart attacks? You know, there's so much information that we really need to know so that we can protect ourselves and children and grandchildren. So be sure and tune in next week as well as every Tuesday at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central. 7 p.m. Pacific. Now, if you're not my Facebook friend, you need to check me out on Facebook. I'm not hard to find. Robin Craig, you'll recognize me. And also on Twitter. And please tell people about the show. And if you would like to support the show, you can go to RobinCraigDirect.com. That's my website. And make a donation on the donations page. And believe me, there's no amount too large or too small. I really appreciate those of you who have donated. And if you have the ability to donate then it's really for a great cause I'm really working hard to bring as many wonderful people to you as I possibly can to really help gain information it's like where do we go to get information Robin Craig live so I love you guys tremendously and remember that on this show we are turning our lemons into lemonade life is always going to dump bags of lemons in our lap but we can turn them into lemonade it's not always easy I'm not saying it's easy but it can be done and as we were saying about the quote from Anne Franks that the one thing that we can do is control ourselves and to become who we really want to become. So I love you guys. I'm going to stick around in the chat room for another few minutes. So stick around and we will keep the dialogue going, okay? All right. You guys are the best.
Have a great, great, great evening.